Today I'm going to do a plane crash investigation video, Hollywood vs. Reality. It's about a FedEx executive who ends up in an airplane crash and then survives on a deserted island. I'll explain it all. Coming up. Hey 7-4 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 7-4 Gear, is all about aviation. So whether you're a pilot or an aviation enthusiast, consider subscribing. When I read the comments from Sully and Flight, the last two movie reviews that I did, it seems like you wanted some more technical aspects of aviation. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do on this Castaway video. I'm gonna get into some more technical aviation aspects of the airplane crash. Let's get into it. Somewhere over the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> you pilots, you're funny. Tahiti Control FedEx 88, position Jenna at 1526. Hey, is all this turbulence from Santa and those eight tiny reindeer? Camera at 1620. Eric is next. Fuel, 9 of 5, decimal 5. Blaine, if you get through a tunnel of deviating south for weather, make another position plot on your deviation left. TD Control, FedEx 88, position Jenna at 1526, flight level 350. I got us plotted. Expecting We're 200 miles south of the original course. Continue Eric plotting and check contingency procedures. Tahiti Control, FedEx 88, broadcasting in the blind. How do you read? I've never been out of calmness. Have you tried a higher HF frequency? Tahiti Control, FedEx 88, broadcasting in the blind. Buckle up, Chuck. How do you get read? Bumpy. Control, FedEx 88, do you read? TD Control, FedEx 88, position Jenna at 1526, flight level 350, expecting Tamara at 1... So the first thing that I want to mention is just that you notice that in cruise there, Tom's got his shoes off, which is totally fine in cruise. It's not a big deal. But just something from a safety aspect that I've seen a lot of passengers start to do recently is they take off their shoes and their socks before the plane is even pushed back. Now, if that engine explodes or there's a situation where you're on the taxiway or still on the ground and you need to immediately evacuate that aircraft and you don't have shoes and socks on and you're running around, there could be glass or shreds of the engine or who knows what on the ground there. So my advice to you is just don't take your shoes off until you get up in the cruise and then if you want to take your shoes and socks off, you can. It's a little bit gross on the floor, but that's your choice. Now in the film here, you saw that section where Tom is waking up and that netting drops off. That's from the bunk area. So the pilots on some planes have a netting there just so they don't get bumped out in turbulence. We don't have that on the 7-4. I guess, I don't know, they don't think we're going to fall out of bed. Our beds are a little lower. I think their beds on this aircraft are stacked. So if you're in the upper bunk, they don't want you to fall out, I guess, kind of like bunk beds. So that netting that's dropping out is just something that is used to keep the pilots into the bed so they don't fall out if there's turbulence. When you're crossing an ocean, even now, some airlines are requiring pilots to do paper plotting charts. And essentially, when you get your flight plan from the dispatcher, it's going to have a route that you're going to fly over the ocean. From there, you're going to draw on a chart exactly each spot you're going to be crossing and there are certain waypoints or checkpoints that you're going to be crossing. The chart you're going to get is going to look something like this. This is a mid-Pacific chart. And on the back here, you have a West Pacific plotting chart. So essentially, once you get your flight plan, it's going to, you're going to draw out exactly where you're going to be. So that line that you saw them draw, that highlighted line, that's essentially where they should be on course. Once you're in flight, you're going to get the GPS coordinates from the plane and you're going to verify it against your plotting chart. 
you're going to verify that you are on your scheduled flight plan and the plane is where it's supposed to be and you are where you think you are and you're going to verify as you're crossing the ocean those different waypoints as you go along. Now something to keep in mind is you're generally not going to end up 200 nautical miles off of your course. To give you an idea that would be like the distance from New York to Washington DC. You might go 10 or 15 miles off of course but you're generally not going to go 200 miles off of course to get around a storm. Ain't nobody got time for that. Before you even leave, your dispatchers are gonna give you a dispatch sheet with all the weather on it. It's gonna look like this. That weather is gonna show your route of flight, which is the red line is that you're gonna be flying, and then it's gonna show you any weather, where the winds are, all these different things, and you're gonna get that packet before you even get to the plane. Now this is an example of a flight that I was doing from Japan to the US. So you can see there's no real inclement weather that's gonna be on that route of flight. If you were gonna have a storm that was gonna be so large that you were gonna have to deviate 200 miles, that's not really likely. That's not gonna be something that's gonna occur right now with technology the way it is with weather. You're not gonna have a dispatcher that's gonna send you there. And if you're looking at the weather before you go, which you should be, you're not gonna go, yeah, I'll, that's fine. I'll fly to that massive thunderstorm, no big deal. That is not how you're gonna do it. So the relief pilot, the pilot jumped out of the bunk, says, did you try a higher frequency? I tried a higher HF frequency. Before you start your ocean crossing, you're gonna get a primary and a secondary radio frequency to reach them on. And those are gonna be high frequency radio stations that you're gonna reach them on. Now you wouldn't randomly just go, oh, I'm gonna try a different high frequency or I'm gonna try a different frequency to reach them on. That's just not how it works. If you've ever flown a plane, you know you can't just randomly tune up a radio and hope that someone's gonna be there. What you have is that primary and your secondary frequency that you would try to reach them on. There's a few other ways to communicate with the planes around you, but He's not talking about that, he's talking about high frequencies, your primary and secondary. Now this movie came out in 2000. More and more what you're having is something called CPDLC. CPDLC is Controller Pilot Data Link Communication. It's a way for the pilots and air traffic control basically to send text messages back and forth. And you're able to request an altitude, a descent or climb or offset for weather, whatever it is. You're able to do that via text message. Here's an example of a CPDLC message that I received on a flight a couple days ago because I knew I was going to make this movie. So here's an example of what a CPDLC message would look like. Air traffic control is writing to us and we're replying back to them, Roger. That's a way for us to communicate back and forth. So that way you're not having to talk on these HF frequencies, which as you can hear, they're very scratchy and they're not that reliable when you're over the middle of the Pacific. If you have weather or things like that, for whatever reason, you can't always hear well or at all, depending on where you're at. The CPDLC is a way to circumvent that and it's a lot easier that you're able to send a message and via satellite get a message back and there's no miscommunications of what's going on. Now, if you watch that video I talked about in doing radio communications and you're listening to air traffic control, if you're listening to busy airports like JFK or places that are handling a lot of international traffic, you might hear someone using CPDLC in their message. So it sounds something like uh, JFK departure, Boeing one, flight level 360, CPDLC. And that's our way to communicate to them, hey, we're connected up on CPDLC, so if you need to send me a message instead of blocking up the radios, you can do that. And they'll give you radio frequency changes or whatever it is, and that's a way to keep moving and keep the radio traffic down. So that's CPDLC, and that's what he's talking about with the higher frequency, so hopefully that clarifies it. All right, let's get back to this movie. If you have a rapid or explosive decompression like what you saw in the video there, what you'll see is misting. Like you saw there, it kind of got hazy. That is actually something that's real and I was told that in some cases it's a lot worse than that because what you're having is a rapid closure rate between the temperature and the dew point. And so you'll get 
obviously a loud boom, and then you can't see anything at all. So that is a real aspect of what would happen in rapid decompression. Also, it's gonna get extremely cold. Obviously, there is an explosion where the hull is breached somewhere, and outside, usually at cruise, is gonna be negative 40 or 50 Celsius. It's gonna be very cold. So that's the other thing. Another thing to keep in mind is they're at flight level 350, so 35,000 feet in the air. At that altitude, you're gonna have roughly 20 seconds of useful consciousness. So if you get into a explosive decompression situation in real life, the first and the very most important thing you can do is get your oxygen mask on. It's gonna take you one a few seconds to figure out what is happening because there's just been this loud explosion your ears are going to hurt and they're going to be ringing there's going to be mist everywhere it's going to take you a few seconds to orient yourself and figure out what's happening so when that happens the first and the very most important thing is get your oxygen mask on there's been cases where one pilot was able to get their mask on and the other one was not and through crew resource management of getting a flight attendant or somebody up there to help get the pilot to get his oxygen mask on everybody was okay However, if you both are slow in delaying to get your masks on, you can imagine that would be a massive problem. So you see him jump out and grab an oxygen mask and try to get it on Tom Hanks first. That's not how it'd be. You'd want to get that mask on yourself and get breathing oxygen because you're only going to have a few seconds of useful consciousness. So it's important that you A, take care of yourself first and then work on somebody else. But it's definitely important to get that oxygen mask on quickly and start breathing oxygen. Because if you don't get it on and start breathing oxygen quickly, you might lose consciousness. And then if the other pilots are in the same situation, now nobody's breathing. And until the plane gets to 10,000 feet, nobody's gonna be awake. And it's not gonna get there until you run out of fuel or you crash. So it's really important if you do get into an explosive decompression situation that you immediately get your mask on. If you remember from flight, I was talking about how that mask expands in the back so you can put it on with one hand. I want to put a clip up here that shows you me expanding those tubes in the back so you're able to grab it and put it on with one hand. And those tubes will actually come out and expand so it can go behind your head. When you let go of that mat, when you let go of those clips, it now sucks onto your face. So we have some like you're seeing there, which is the full face, and we have others like you see that Tom Hanks is using, which is just the oxygen side, but they both work the exact same way. You release it and it sucks onto your face and now you're breathing oxygen and it's holding a tight seal around your face. All right, let's get back to Castaway. Okay, now there's a lot of Hollywood stuff in that movie, and that's kind of why I'm laughing. There's some things he says like, I'm bringing it down and out. That's not something you would ever say, even in a normal situation, let alone emergency. And they're both all just screaming out words. Nobody's really doing anything. In a real emergency, something like that, you have a quick reference handbook, a QRH, and you're reading through a checklist to do certain tasks. So you're going through those tasks. One guy's reading it, the other guy's doing it, or one guy's reading it and doing it, the other guy's flying, but nobody's in any situation are both people just screaming out random words and hitting switches. That is not how it works in a real emergency. When you're down to 10,000 feet or 14,000 feet, depending on what your company's policies are and where you're at flying, obviously they're over the ocean, so 10,000 feet is fine, but once you're down to that altitude, you can take your mask off. However, they were at 35,000 feet, and they got down to 10,000 feet in about a minute, so you're not going to descend 25,000 feet in one minute for two reasons. One, planes don't go down that fast unless there is something missing like wings. Uh, and two, you're not going to want to accelerate in a descent with a rapid or explosive decompression. And here's why. If you have a rapid or explosive decompression and you don't know what the status is or what the hull of your aircraft is looking like, and you are now accelerating your aircraft, you might have pieces of the hull that are holding on, but are might be out into the wind. And if you accelerate, you may end up ripping more of your hull apart, and now the whole plane is lost. So if you have a rapid or explosive decompression, one, you're gonna wanna get down as quickly as you can, yet your statuses of your aircraft you're not going to want to accelerate because that can damage your aircraft even more. In a lot of cases, what you'll do is you'll hit a speed descent mode. So you hold that speed and you'll do your speed brakes, which are those things that come up on the wings to help you slow down. And obviously you're gonna pull your throttles to idle and you're gonna go down as fast as you can, but while maintaining that speed. So that way, whatever is out there that's surviving right now is probably gonna survive at that speed as you go down. 
if you know what this current situation is and that the hull of the aircraft is fine, well then you might want to accelerate and get down at the maximum speed that the airplane can go. But if you're unsure, then you're not going to want to accelerate like what they're doing. They obviously had an explosive decompression. Nobody knows exactly what is going on. So you're not going to accelerate and you're not going to make it down in a minute. You're not going to get 25,000 feet in a minute. That's just not going to happen. All right, let's get back to the movie. Okay, first, that's the reason why if you're in a lot of turbulence, you're not going to unbuckle your seatbelt and then stand up without holding on to anything. Because if you do that, you might get thrown up into the ceiling and smash your head. So don't do that. Uh -huh. Okay, all right, good talk coach, thanks. Because then you may end up having two people hurt and nobody's getting helped. So I know in situations when I've been flying with passengers in the back and we're about to hit some turbulence, I usually call ahead to the flight attendants and let them know, hey, why don't you take your seats? Some pilots will end up calling, but if they're not near a phone, then it can make it even harder for them. They may be trying to get to the phone in order to get there to find out what's going on. So in my case, what I always do, if there's some turbulence that we're hitting or I think it's about to get even worse, I'll just make a PA and say, flight attendants, take your seats. So they'll either hold on to something or if they're near their seats, they'll sit down and buckle in. Regardless, I want to make sure that they're safe. And that's why you'll always hear pilots and flight attendants tell you while you're seated, buckle your seatbelt because we don't always know the turbulence that we're going to hit. In some cases we do know, but we don't always know. And that's the reason why. While I'm up on the flight deck, I always have my seatbelt buckled. It's not a big deal. Just keep your seatbelt buckled and that way if there is any turbulence, you're not getting thrown up into the cockpit, into the buttons or anything that's up there. And if you're sitting in the back, you're not getting thrown out of your seat or having anything that is going to damage or hurt you. So it's important that you do that. Now on the cargo, you saw me laughing when those things were sliding out and here's why. On the front side of those, which is for a lateral movement of the plane going forward and backwards, there's these heavy blockers that are in there and they're set for each cargo container so it can only move a little bit forward and backwards. And on the side, you'll have these latches which prevent it from popping out of its spot or sliding left or right. They're in these rails so they can't go and pop out. And every flight, if you're flying cargo, before the plane even takes off, one of the pilots will go walk the deck. And while they're doing that, they're verifying all these latches are in place for the whole plane. And that's to make sure that if you're in turbulence or in takeoff or whatever it is when things are moving around, that these things are not flying out of place. So that's something that is never going to happen regardless of how turbulent the plane is. Those things are not going to start bouncing around like that. All right, let's get back to the movie. Okay, I'm gonna pause it right there. I know when the Sully video came out, everybody loved talking about the ditching switch. And he says in there, ditching switch on. So the ditching switch is basically something that's gonna close a lot of the valves. Now in this scenario, the plane obviously has a huge hole in it. You're gonna go crash in the ocean. There's five people on board. You're all gonna get off in the first 20 or 30 seconds and the plane is gonna be lost no matter what. So a ditching switch in this situation is not going to help you. But that's essentially what he's saying is ditching switch on was B on some checklists on some aircrafts you'll have a ditching switch which is to close some of the valves to make the plane float a little longer. They're in a storm with a huge hole in the plane. That plane is going to be sinking pretty quick anyways. So those five guys are going to get out fine and hopefully get into the raft that Chuck is holding. But that's what a ditching switch is and I, I just pause it because I know in that Sully video a lot of people like talking about the ditching switch. So let's finish this video.
that's the end of that film. Now you saw it as they're coming in there, he says, I got a visual. Well, yeah, you're looking at a wall of water. So at that speed, with that size of an aircraft, if you're looking at a wall of water, uh, you're going to be in a very steep nosedive or facing a huge swell. So your plane's not gonna make it through there. And obviously I realized it was a movie. It definitely wasn't an aviation designed movie, but I wanted to address this because it has a lot of very technical aspects. And I know that a lot of you were looking for some more technical things about aviation. So hopefully I answered some questions for you. Now I put a link to the film Castaway in the description below. It is actually a great movie and Tom Hanks does a fantastic job. It is not easy to make a movie that long where you're basically by yourself. He does an amazing job in the movie. So if you haven't watched it, I definitely recommend it. It is a great movie. All right, crew, in the comments below, let me know, did you like this more technical aspect of aviation as I reviewed this movie, or did you prefer Sully, which was more of a, a general overlay? I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.